from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell in London and I've been enjoying a good bit of family time in the last week, managing to spend some time with my young niece and nephew. And we've had cousins visiting from Adelaide in Australia as well. So a few excursions, uh, a bit of a trip to the Natural History Museum as well as a little bit of outdoor action while the weather is still quite mild here in the UK. But certainly been good to fit in the family time before the cricket all kicks in again. Ali, Brett Sprigg here this week, actually in Perth, my old hometown, taking a bit of a break from my usual ABC commitments. But the cricket won't take a break, of course, with the World Cup, the T20 World Cup on Australian shores in just a few moments, which we'll talk about later on. And of course, the WBBL starts this week as well. So there's a real sense that uh, the home summer is really firing up here down under. Good for you, Brett. I'm glad you're going to be busy. I'm uh, not so sure about myself. Some personal time. I'm actually in New Delhi, run away from home again, this time for personal reason. No work really for a change. There's a wedding sort of in the friend and family circle, but really happy to be here. There was a lot of rain, lots of uh, warnings uh, meteorologically here, but for the moment, it's nice and sunny and wonderful to be in Delhi. So good time of the year. And uh, as you know, a lot of cricket action has just ended in India, largely in favor of the Indian team. So it's been uh, rewarding uh, to, to be watching a little bit of cricket the last month or so. Yeah, and there's only small windows, isn't there, where there's not much cricket on. So you've got to make the most of it. Amazing, Charity, to know that you're out and about, not actually working. So good on you. Enjoy the personal <laughs> time. And Brett, great to have you with us as well. Of course, there is only one place that we're going to start and indeed focus on this week, and that is Down Under in Australia, because the Men's T20 World Cup is finally getting underway. The group stage begins this weekend with the teams who have uh, qualified automatically, then joining later on in the Super 12s. That's in a week's time. Uh, and that is when the host Australia will take on their nearest neighbours, New Zealand. Now, I've been speaking to the man who is officially the world's best T20 bowler, Josh Hazelwood. Now, he didn't play any T20 internationals between 2016 and 2020. He's been rather kept in cotton wool for the test team, but he played a crucial role in Australia winning the last T20 World Cup in Dubai, and he is currently the number one ranked T20 bowler in international cricket. I caught up with him earlier and started by asking just how he's feeling about defending the title on home soil. Yeah, it's obviously exciting. Um, you know, play, anytime you're playing cricket at home, but in particular, you know, a World Cup event, I think I cast back to 2015 a lot of the time and, and try and remember how that sort of unfolded and, um, you know, everything that had to do with that tournament and was successful, obviously, in that as well. So um, I just remember the crowd at the MCG being, you know, packed to the rafters um, for every game, in particular the opening game and, and the final as well. So, um, yeah, it's amazing atmosphere and um, hopefully we can replicate something like that. Yeah, it's been a busy period in, in the lead-up, hasn't it? Wins in the ODI series... Uh, with New Zealand and Zimbabwe, the T20 series victory against the West Indies, but then a couple of losses to India and England. So how do you sort of weigh up where the team is at the moment? Yeah, I think we're in a pretty good place. We're, I think we're really, really close to, you know, nailing the perfect game. Um, we've had wins and losses in the last sort of few months in, in both formats, as you've mentioned, and um, we've had players in and out and um, a lot of travel as well, which has been quite demanding. So sort of just been you know, trying a few things here and there. And um, last night, you know, probably most of our batters were, were back and, and obviously most of our bowlers. So close to our number one team was back last night and, um, you know, fortunately didn't get the chocolates last night, but um, still trying a few different things here and there. And, um, uh, yeah, I think we're, we're pretty close to a, a perfect game. So what do you believe your greatest assets have been in the way that you've developed you know, your own skills, particularly in this last two years, which has seen you, you know, rise up to the top of the rankings? Yeah, it's probably, you know, a lot of the time we're looking at stats and, and footage of players and in particular batters, obviously, being in, in bowls, many different things. And um, a lot of the time it comes back to that hard length is, is a lower strike rate. Um, but in saying that, it's sort of sequencing it with other deliveries to, to maximise the impact of those balls. So. I think it's just about having having all those deliveries in your arsenal, but it's just about when you're using them and how you're using them in order, I guess. And it gives you a bit more leeway on some deliveries if you're sequencing it with others. So, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a cat and mouse game out there with, with the batters, um, in particularly when, when I bowl, I guess, which is at the start and at the end. So um, it's good fun and it's, it's a good challenge and I enjoy it. And you've mentioned the the pre-planning, the analysis, you know, watching footage, that sort of thing. 
I mean, there is so much available to you. What is the key to to doing that effectively and, and you know, being able to bring that into a game? Yeah, it's a good question. There's there's a lot of a lot of data. Um, I guess the, the main thing that I look at is probably what works on the the field we're playing on, the wicket we're playing on. So, in particular, Canberra at the moment, what's the what's the general statistics on that ground and what works? Um, and then I guess you go into depth on the batters you're facing, in particular, you know, the top six of each team. So it's um, where they like to hit the ball, what they don't like, and um, yeah, trying to put that all together in a package, I guess, and um, be ready for that uh, but again I, I sort of get a really feel for it once I get onto the ground and following to that player and seeing how things are working because because every week it's different we play on and it's um the mindset of the batter is different as well so it's um yeah thinking on your feet as well the experience that you've gained in T20 around the world you obviously had success with Sydney Sixers but you've had recent success uh, in the IPL uh, what impact has you know, the time that you've spent with Chennai Super Kings had on your own game development, would you say? Oh, it's been huge. Um, you know, I was with Chennai for, for two years and then again with RCB last year. Um, I think just the experience around the, the change rooms, in particular Chennai being a quite a seasoned team and an experienced team um, in the batting and bowling departments and, and in the coaching staff in particular as well. So sort of put all that together and... Um, you know, you come up with a few different plans for, for different conditions, whether it be the UAE or, or India. So, again, it's just adding to that sort of rep, repertoire in the, in the back of your mind and adding to the package and, I guess, just remembering everything that, that goes on in those camps um, and, and putting it together into your game. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of experience there to, to lean on. And do you reckon it helps the familiarity that you've got with guys who, you know, are teammates but now opponents, which has become so commonplace? Yeah, it can do, but it, they're obviously know your game pretty well as well. Mm. So it um, it can work both ways. So you sort of might keep something up your sleeve during IPL for, for international cricket to try and <laughs> surprise them. But I think, you know, we're always working on stuff in, in the nets. Um, so you're sort of adding to your game all the time. And I guess just about trying it in a, in a game and um, having the confidence to do that. Well, that was Australia fast bowler Josh Hazelwood. Brett, so what did you make of what he had to say? What are you expecting from Australia then at this Home World Cup? Uh, look, the curious thing about the Australians is they haven't even, even though they are the defending champions, Ali, and they're at home, there isn't a great deal of stability in their lineup. We still don't know what the best Australian eleven is. And the pertinent question from a batting point of view is, is Steve Smith a part of it? The answer, it seems, is no. He's not. Uh, Australia's lineup now is very heavy on all rounders, a la Mitch Marsh and Marcus Stoinis in that middle order, uh, as well as where Cameron Green fits in there. But the really exciting thing is the emergence of 26 year old phenom Tim David. Now, this is obviously, uh, I think if you, you follow your cricket, you'll know who he is by now. Singapore He's been born. On stumped as well, yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Singapore born, Perth raised. He was playing World Cup qualifiers for Singapore only three years ago. Wasn't getting much of a game with the Perth Scorchers. Went to the Hobart Hurricanes. Fast forward to now where he's the most expensive Aussie in the IPL. It's a great story, but his inclusion has only caused a bit of a selection headache. You just never quite know with tournament cricket as well. You still might see Steve Smith and Josh Inglis, for example, in those group games for for the sake of rotation or the fact there are quite a few players out of form in that Australian team. Um, I also observe... Their fielding, um, certainly compared to England in these most recent games um, happening at the moment, um, it's left a lot to be desired. So there are still a few questions around this Australian team. Um, you know, if nothing else, their bowling lineup is full strength. And as you chatted, Josh Hazel were there. Um, Aaron Finch may change the new ball around a little bit. We saw that uh, in this England series, whereby um, Mitchell Stark wasn't taking the new ball, which is something he's done continually for the last ten years. Um, I expect the. Uh, the Australians will be there at the end. They'll be there at at least the, the semis, but where to from there? As we all know in this format, you need a bit of luck, a bit of rubber the green to go your way. So we'll see where it all ends up. The rest uh, may be up to them. That is the exciting thing about the T20 format, isn't it? What about their neighbours, New Zealand, uh, the team they beat in last year's final? What sort of shape uh, are they heading uh, Are they in heading into the tournament? Well, I saw them most recently here in Australia in the 50-over format. They were clean swept in the Chapel Hadley series by the hosts. Um, their 
form in the shorter format is more reasonable. They've only lost the two matches in this calendar year so far. Um, theirs is a team made up of experience, especially up top. You've got Martin Guptill and Kane Williamson. Um, one of the world's informed cricketers at the moment is Daryl Mitchell, their all-rounder. Interestingly, New Zealand will have to face Australia in the first match of the, the Super 12, the tournament proper, if you like, at the SCG um, next week. That'll be a huge game, of course, given their, their recent history. But I think arguably a bigger game for New Zealand will come against England, which is their second last group game. And by that stage, we'll have a clear idea, I expect, of the semi final picture. Uh, so it could well decide which of those goes through. And we know those teams as well, Ali, have had history in recent times in big games, uh, New Zealand and England. So can't wait to see how it all sort of plays out in that group. But uh, New Zealand looking pretty good as far as the T20 format goes. Yeah, will it be a close encounter? Will it be a victory by the barest of margins again for one side <laughs> or another? It feels as if New Zealand are sort of almost everybody's favourite, you know, second team to win, you know, other than your, your own country. <laughs> if New Zealand were, were to you know, finally lift a, a big trophy like that, then it would be, would be a very popular winner for sure. Um, Charu, last week we discussed how Jasprit Bumrah's injury would affect India. So just have a listen here. This is about what Sunil Gupta had to say on the show. It's a blow, but it's not a devastating blow. I don't think it's a blow that India will not recover from. In fact, I think they can grow from strength to strength. We're seeing some new bowlers coming up. Frankly, if you ask me, if there's one cricketer that India will miss in the T20 World Cup, it is Jadeja. Mm, so he's saying Ravindra Jadeja, who's missing because of a water skiing accident, is, is a bigger loss than Bumrah. What do you make of that? In many ways, I agree. Because there is this new cliche in the world of cricket about uh, three-dimensional players and Ravinder Jadeja is all of that. He is a very clever bowler. Of course, we know he's a great finisher, match winner with the bat on occasion. And uh, in the field, he's electrifying. I mean, either in the, uh, the, the infield with those runouts or, or, or a catch, maybe in the outfield, one of those rockets that he sends back to the... So he's a very useful player without question. Bumrah, we can't expect much from the bat, but he is India's spearhead, no doubt about that. So, yes, he will be missed. And yes, perhaps Sunil is right that Jadeja will be missed a shade more because he contributes in all departments. I mean, you always look at India and say, you know, they've, they've got to be right up there amongst the favourites. But, you know, do you place them that high? Uh, well, for the well, for a lot of people listening, I have no choice but to say yes. <laughs> but uh, I don't mean to be disrespectful. I think they are one of the finest teams in the world. I just think that they are a little underdone in the fast bowling department at this point of time. Uh, don't have too many other worries, though. But... I also feel that the Indian performance uh, is uh, far more affected by the conditions they play in. I don't think they play enough in Australia or down south, enough uh, for them to uh, take that in their stride. So they may be uh, a little more harshly done uh, because of the different conditions in Australia and therefore slip from perhaps the number one team uh, in other areas of the world or the Middle East elsewhere. I know they had that big Asia Cup reversal, but they are in the top four for sure. I do think because of this little confusion in the fast bowling department, uh, and that's at least 12, if not more overs out of the 20, uh, they will not be f firm or clear favourites, sadly. Mm, you mentioned the Asia Cup, of course, India didn't make the final uh, of that tournament. That was uh, contested between Pakistan and Sri Lanka. So just to, to talk about Pakistan for a moment, I mean, it's been a bit of a mixed time for them. They lost that Asia Cup final, uh, then had the celebration of England's return to the country uh, for the first time in 17 years, but then lost the T20 series 4-3. Uh, in your opinion, does this Pakistan side have what it takes to win uh, a major tournament? Where do you place them? Absolutely. I think they're a very, very underrated team, if they're underrated at all. I know you talk about that narrow 4-3 loss in Pakistan, but, you know, there was a lot of emotion running through the, the whole series. I think they have everything it takes. Uh, maybe a bit of a hole in the middle order, because if the top doesn't work, Mohamed Rizwan, of course, the number one batsman in the world at this point of time, Babar Azam, the best, if you can make a differential between number one and the best. But uh, that accounts for a terrific start. In the middle, they might struggle a bit, but you can't argue about their fast bowlers, especially if Shaheen Shafridi is 100%. Now, he's been out for a while. If he's in, he will love Australian pitches at six foot six. He can you know, uh, both some very difficult lines and lengths as well. Uh, they've got Nassim, who is bowling really well. Harris Rao, Benz is back. So they've got a very, very good fast bowling attack. They've got Shadab, who's the vice captain. They've got good spinners as well. So they're a nearly complete team. They've got just a bit of a hole in the middle in terms of the middle order bat. But uh, I can't see why they would not be leading contenders uh, for sure, despite the scores that you mentioned back in uh, Pakistan in that England series. 
Yeah, I, I think can't that's wait what for I that felt. Pakistan. Um, Sorry, Ali. <laughs> just, that, just the highlight will be Pakistan, yeah. mm. India, MCG, oh. 100,000 people. Yeah. It will be phenomenal. I can't wait for that. It's amazing how <laughs> yeah. India and Pakistan always end up in the same group for an ICC tournament, isn't it? Yeah. I can't yeah. think you know, how, how, that, how that happens. <laughs> but no, I think I agree with you, Chara, about, about just feeling as if Pakistan have a slightly weaker middle order than, you know, than when they made the semi final in, in 2021. But, you know, Baba Azam could could yet finish as the tournament's leading run scorer. I mean, he'd be a it'd be my hot tip to to be right up there as a as a leading run scorer again by the end. Is it time to talk about England? Do you think? Ah, uh, well, I I you know, Ali, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, and I thought what Johnny Bairstow said last week was very interesting, and I'd love for all of us on Stump to catch up on that before we get your comments on England, Ali. We weren't in a good place at the start of the summer as a group of group of players as England cricket. We weren't really in, in a, an amazing bit, and it's actually quite interesting to to hear the shift of people now speaking about Test cricket being stronger than white ball cricket. Well, there you go. So, I mean, does it really make such a difference, Ali? Because uh, in red ball cricket, they've been kind of it's been a very strange but very useful performance uh, by England. But will it translate to white ball cricket as well? This whole baseball thing. I mean, it has been a complete turnaround, hasn't it? England were in the absolute depths during the Ashes and Red Bull cricket was in the mire and it's led to a complete, you know, review of the entire domestic structure in the UK whilst the White Bull team were world champions. Then suddenly Owen Morgan retires and steps away from the captaincy. Joss Butler takes over and they've got a new coach in, in Matthew Mott and things are a little bit different. Where's the weakness? Where's the Achilles heel? Where, where do they lack, if at all? No, I'm, not, I'm going to give you nothing. <laughs> I'm going to put them up. I'm going to put them up there. I th- you know, I think they've um, they've got batters who enjoy like the pace and the bounce of, of Australian pitches, and Milan in particular, hard hitter of the ball. Hale's a hard hitter. You know, they've got depth. If if either one of them you know disappears, you've got Phil Salt sort of waiting in the wings. A lot of players who have got big bash experience. Here's a weakness then for you, Charu. It's not appealing when there's an opportunity to take a wicket. <laughs> <laughs> so how ruthless is Joss Butler going to be either if somebody obstructs someone in the field, is he going to appeal? Or indeed, if there's an opportunity uh, no. to run out a non-striker, would he do it? Well, he set out his stall on that and said he wouldn't. I just really wonder what would happen if that was in the final <laughs> and somebody's encroaching out of their ground. I, I feel it's, it's, going, it's going to happen. There's going to be an opportunity for England to effect a run out at the non-striker's end in a crux situation. And that's going to be very, very interesting just to see what happens. It's all by the rules now. It's OK. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, that is all we've got time for on this week's Stump. So my thanks to Chari Sharma and to Brett Sprigg. And of course, to all of you. And we'll see you again next time. Bye for now. From the BBC World Service, in association with ABC and All India Radio, this is Stumped.